Well, today we unveil Trust in the Workplace, um, our second round of this. Um, we did one for September last year, and um, we have just come out of uh, seven markets uh, across uh, Asia, Europe, and the United States and Latin America. 7,000 people, 1,000 per market, online survey of employees, people who are working at the moment. So let me just get right to the data. We find that my employer is the last bastion of trust. Specifically, we see a trust crash for government in the last four months since we last um, reported out um, at uh, Summer Davos in May. Um, we find that, uh, in fact, uh, government has crashed in the U.K. and the U.S. No surprise in the U.K. The U.S. is a bit surprising um, that, in fact, business continues to be the most trusted institution overall. But here's what you need to know. In fact, it is my employer, not just business in general. My employer is 16 points higher than business in general. Trust is local. And the gap between the four institutions overall as an average business, government, media, NGOs versus my employer is now a record 30 points in the UK, 27 in the US, 26 in Brazil, 24 in Germany, 22 in Japan. In short, employer, a bulwark of stability. Trust is local specifically. What do we mean? It's in my coworkers. It is in my manager, it is in my head of HR, and my CEO. It is true that CEOs overall have improved over the last few years, but I just want you to see the gap between government leaders and CEOs. It explains a lot of what I'm going to tell you in a moment. This is a very interesting and important new finding. The workplace is our island of civility. What does that mean exactly? First, after friends and family, my most important community is my workplace, the people I work with. Again, universal across the world. Also, the workplace feels less politicized than last year, especially in the United States where we have the biggest partisan problem. Take a look. Two-thirds of people say my employer is doing a good job keeping politics out of the workplace. That's a stunning finding. And in fact, among Republicans, it's up 12. Among Democrats, up 8. Fairly equal, 66, 68. It's easier to talk about societal issues with our coworkers than it is our neighbors, whether it's gender equality, LGBTQ, racism, reproduction rights. The point is, it is difficult in our neighborhoods. I can do this at work. It's a very interesting reason why employers should urge people to come back to workplace. People are also confident that their coworkers will respect divergent opinions and respect the truth, that we can agree on basic facts, that they are open to different perspectives and they won't be violent. Third key point, the workplace is where we address societal problems. I started the presentation by telling you the gap between my employer and all other institutions. The gap between my employer and government is stunning. In some cases, 40 points. So the workplace, therefore, becomes where I expect that we can get to the societal problems. If you look to the reasons people take jobs. Career advancement, of course. That continues to be number one. Very close, though, is personal empowerment. Specifically, I want to feel as if my CEO is listening to me, that it's easy for me to give input, that I get regular and truthful communication, that I'm, in fact, involved in a planning process. So that's empowerment. Third, on societal impact, which continues to rise, business reflects my values, that we have a purpose, that there's meaningful work that we do in our companies. I want to address societal problems. It's a deal breaker when considering a job for seven out of 10 people. In fact, we have not reached the limit of what is expected of companies on societal issues across a whole array of issues across the world. 
human rights, inequality, racial justice, climate change. We want more business, not less. And that demand for the employer taking a stand grows both among Republicans and Democrats. The only issue on which there is a massive Republican view against is gun safety and also reproductive rights. Across all the other issues, a majority of Republicans, I'm more likely to work for a company if that company stands up and speaks up on economic inequality, racial justice, et cetera. And of course, Democrats, 20 points different, higher. Even the job insecure will not compromise on this idea of employer societal engagement. I want my CEO to speak up on issues, both job insecure and secure. Same about addressing societal problems. I want my job to be able to let me do that. Also, there's a new employer mandate. Bridge the societal divide. You can do this as a company. Sydney, to you. Thanks, Richard. So staying on slide 17 for a moment, this new employer mandate really marks a significant shift in employee expectations. Employees are telling the employer, use your platform to be the disseminator of reliable information. Listen to and act upon the worker voice. Set examples for civil discourse and be an active force in bridging societal divides. But how does an employer address societal issues and take a stand whilst keeping polarization out of the workplace? Well, first, let's take a look at what employees are telling us about how to do this. Let's have a look on the next slide, 18, please. Let's first look at how employers are earning trust. Here we see that we asked on 30 different dimensions and characteristics of an organization that could have an impact on how much people trust their employers and found that the number one driver is employers who offer trustworthy, who are trustworthy sources of information, especially about contentious issues. The number two driver, as you see here, is employers who make employees feel comfortable voicing their opinions, even when they're different from those of their bosses. And as you can see here, these are more likely to increase trust even more than pay paying a fair wage to employees. Next slide. Workplace culture is critical to ensuring employees feel comfortable during um, and discussing divergent opinions. Having a zero tolerance policy for personal attacks or hate speech or providing resources for employees to use if a coworker acts disrespectfully towards them helps to keep the temperature down on hot button issues. Executive behavior matters too. CEOs who acknowledge uh, different perspectives within their workforce, different perspectives than their own, they're modeling civil discourse. There's some relevant reading on this topic, um, leading a workforce with highly divergent and polarized views. And it's coming from Stanford University professor, Dr. Jamil Zaki, who's an Edelman collaborator with the employee experience team. In this month's issue of HBR, he describes the factors that are causing the rise of workplace and societal cynicism. Uh, but the good news is he, he says there, that can be addressed. But the larger problem he's addressing in that article is conflicts within organizations where people hold increasingly divergent views. So you might want to check out that article. Next slide, uh, slide 20. When you're sharing information, credibility matters. And which voices um, you choose, they have varying rates of credibility with different stakeholders across the workforce. In other words, what this slide is telling us is different sources resonate with different stakeholders within the organization. For example, non-managers are more likely to trust their coworkers to tell them what the truth about what's happening inside the company. And managers trust their own direct managers and senior managers look to the CEO. So in sum, when you're communicating and engaging your workforce, tap into the trusted voices at each level. And when the voice of the CEO that's conveying reliable information is working alongside the proximity and the trustworthiness of my manager and my coworkers, you, you have a trifecta of trusted sources within your organization. On slide 21, please. 
elevate and act on employee voices. They are not shy about speaking up when they see something that their employer is doing that concerns them. And 40% of employees have personally or know someone who has spoken out against an employer behaving badly. And when they speak out, most do feel they're being heard. The vast majority, as you see here, 68% who have spoken up or raised a concern about working conditions say they've been able to make an impact by doing so. And this is how leaders, again, can model that civilized discourse by recognizing other voices' opinions and then taking them into consider serious consideration and acting upon them. This is another element of earning employee trust. But on the next slide, the most important way leaders can build trust is by placing their trust in employees first. Simply put, to earn their trust, give them yours. Among the 71% who said they feel their CEO trusts them, you see really high employee trust. But when people don't feel their CEO trusts them, the picture changes very dramatically. They distrust not only the workplace, but also the management. Next slide. Restoring societal trust from the inside out. This is the newest expectation that employees have of their employers to build not only trust within the organization, but to restore societal trust. On the next slide, you'll see the pressure is now on employers to export this model of civil discourse into society at large. Young employees especially want their employer to make information about contentious information, uh, contentious issues available to the public. They feel that employers should even train their employees on how to have conversations about contentious issues outside of the workplace. And in short, activist employees want activist employers. Next slide, please. Employers more believable than government or media. We've seen this in the last report, but here we understand that his, that desire, uh, that um, believability is, is increased. Um, and why is this important? If employees are more likely to trust information that comes from their employer than any other source, social media, traditional media, et cetera, why is this important in society right now? If you go to the next slide, it's important because the leadership that employers embody radiates out to other fa facets of society. And it's very critical uh, to restoring societal trust overall. You see here, what this slide means is that as levels of trust, employer trust increase, so does trust in other institutions. This final surprising statistic is the new clarion call. Employer trust is a critical component and indicator of building trust in society overall. Back to you, Richard. To uh, Kevin and the panel, I want to have four concluding points. The first is we believe that you must start by trusting your people. Let your employees speak up, speak their views, get their input and act on it. Make decisions transparently. Inside out, trust building. Second, it is clear that my employer is expected to address societal issues that align with your mission, your vision, that give people a sense within the company that you are having impact. Uh, and do take on the key issues of the day, climate change, fair wages, PE and I, job training. Third, it is clear that the workplace becomes that island of civility, that in fact, it is a precious place. Create an environment that enables good discussions. Have opportunities for people to socialize in a non-contentious way. Last, recognize your role as the employer in restoring societal trust. You, as my employer, can drag the rest of society along and improve the performance of all of the other four institutions. Because otherwise, we are in a bad place. We have got to get to 
a more even balance among the institutions. My employer plays a key role in that. So Kevin, my good friend, over to you. Great, thank you. And the foundation of trust is always a good backup plan. So here we are going back at it. Thank you for your patience, everyone. So we have a panel here, four really expert perspectives on the issues that Richard and Sydney have been talking about. I'm gonna quickly introduce them and dive in, but also encourage you in the Q&A part of the uh, chat to please place any questions and we'll try and get to them through this conversation. So first, I wanna start with Anuradha Razdan. She's Chief Human Resources Officer of Unilever South Asia and Executive Director of Hindustan Unilever Limited. She's also a member of Unilever's Global HR Leadership Team. Dane Holmes is co-founder and CEO of Escalera, an enterprise software company that builds inclusive, productive work cultures through people empowerment and database insights. Prior to Escalera, Dane was the global head of human capital management at Goldman Sachs and serves on the board of KKR. Uh, next, there's Dylan Gambardella. He's co-founder and CEO of NextGen HQ, a learning platform that helps young people develop entrepreneurial skills to succeed at work and in life. Dylan is also the co-author of the book, Now That's Momentum, How the Next Generation Can Think Like Entrepreneurs to Succeed at Work and Life. And then finally, there's Nicola Acut. She's Vice President for Environmental Social Governance at VMware, where she shapes ESG strategy across operations, product portfolio, and customer engagement. Nicola earlier launched the VMware Foundation and led VMware's corporate social responsibility and sustainability functions. So we're gonna dive right into the discussion. And again, please uh, put any questions you have for the panel in the chat. So Dane, I wanna start with you. As Rich highlighted, the Trust Institute's research makes much of the notion that the workplace can be an island of civility with employees saying, the people they work with are an important source of community, and often it's easier for them to discuss contentious issues with their colleagues than with their neighbors. Is this something that employers should be leaning to, leaning into in any specific ways? Yeah, I, you know, uh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and yes, they sh they should be leaning into it. And I, but I say that with a a, a few couple of conditions. Um, which are, I, I think, in many cases, relatively standard. The first and foremost is um, you should be having conversations. You should be facilitating conversations with your employees, largely because they're happening whether you facilitate them or not. And so what I try and remind people is these are happening. Um, and so the, the question is, can you arrange them to happen in a way that would be more productive and beneficial to both the individuals and to the organization? In order for that to happen, I think there's a couple of things that need to stay at your forefront of your mind. One, what is the intention of the conversation? Is it thought leadership? Is it just about social connection? Is it actually giving people information? But what is the intention and stick to the intention and be transparent about the intention? The other part I'd say is, what are you uniquely well positioned to do? I, I use this you whoop all the time, UWP. Um, and I think also in these conversations, starting from the perspective of what are you uniquely well positioned to talk about or how to address it? Um, you know, if it's a, a racial justice issue, Hey, and your financial institution, can you think about the financial implications of this uh, that exists in the market? But where are you really an expert and where are you not? And then the last thing I would say is have really good understanding of where the organization is, which also often means leadership, get out of the way. Um, what's really happening on in the organization is not happening on the executive floor. It's happening. It's happening in the parking lot on the way in, in the elevator up and down, in the cafeteria. And so I would just remind people to be very clear about understanding what is the conversation, not that you maybe as a senior leader want to have, but actually the people uh, want to have and make sure you're pretty well informed on that. Dane, you know, some organizations recently, including Basecamp and Coinbase and Facebook to some extent on questions around reproductive rights, have tried to limit or actually ban discussion of political issues, societal issues in the workplaces. And I, my, what I'm hearing from you is your perspective is these conversations are going to take place anyway, and it's better for the employer to think strategically about them rather than try and abolish them. Is that is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and um, the other thing I just try and remind all leaders of is there's no such thing as good or bad decisions. There's just, you know, worse or terrible decisions. And so a lot of times I feel like when these organizations are making this decision of should I do this or shouldn't I do this, they're acting as if there's only a positive outcome, but sometimes the decision is really a, a, a outcome of lesser evils. And so to me, uh, the concept of saying people really wanna have a conversation, but you're gonna ban it, 
all that does is, you know, raise people's resistance, their ire, and they're going to then have the conversation. So, you know, I, I think I think on some of these things, just like you wouldn't um, say to your client, hey, we really don't want, you know, a client really wants something from a product. You wouldn't say to the client, stop wanting that thing from our product. Yeah, got it. And noting that there are, there are worse and terrible decisions for future <laughs> yes. decision making. Dylan, I want to move to you as Sydney noted and focus on younger employees for a second. As Sydney noted, this data tells us that young employees expect employers to inform how to have civil discourse on contentious issues, both inside and interestingly outside the workplace as well. What does this mean in practical terms? And, and put differently, what are the concrete steps that employers can take to stabilize discourse outside of their four walls? I love it. Kevin, thank you for the question. And Richard and team, thank you for having me. Uh, Dane, so much that I agree with, I'm sure I'll touch upon in my response here. If you think about all of us here on the call, and maybe I, I happen to be on the younger side of the group, uh, so I'll share my unique perspective and from learning in, in the next gen world that I operate within. Uh, how many times when you meet somebody in a social setting and they ask, oh, who are you, right? Nicola, who are you? Tell me about yourself, Dane. We start with our employer. We start with our job, right? It's a sense of identity. It's a sense of who we are. And so to Dane's point, knowing that they're gonna be talking about us at dinner, the next morning at brunch, when they come into the office at lunch with employees, right? It's a cohesive culture level uh, opportunity that I think employers have. And to your question, Kevin, I think the first part of knowing how to have positive discourse is thinking about when. And Dane put it really, I love that line, uniquely well positioned. When are you uniquely well positioned to get involved? Are you showing that through investment? Are you making opportunities for your employees to get involved from a uh, maybe employee resource group standpoint, from philanthropic endeavors. I think that Gen Z, the younger employees have just a higher bar for authenticity and transparency. And if they don't see that shining through, they'll call you out on that social media post. That really was the end all be all of your attempt to facilitate discourse. But I also recognize the young people have a high appetite for learning. I think the data actually shows that. We want to be learning from our employers. It's almost a, a unique expectation that your employer, he, he or she or they have to teach you how to operate. You're looking to them and expecting that in a way when you get that first job, right? That is your life and your first opportunity. Uh, so I think it is really, I'll use that opportunity for once again, a tremendous chance for employers to really stand out and to pick the issues that they want to talk about, go deep, provide the opportunities for a diverse dialogue, and then really show the impact by letting people feel like their voice was heard, that it was recognized, and that some change came out of it. And whatever that is, report on it. Really show the results as they come full circle. And I think one of the takeaways from the survey today, I think for a lot of leaders is probably, what does that look like in my own organization? What does it look like to encourage civil discourse? What does it like look like to actually teach people how to engage in constructive civil discourse? Nicola, I want to turn to you now. Uh, one of the interesting findings that Richard highlighted from the survey is that the is that the majority of Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. alike now expect their employers to do more to address societal issues such as healthcare access, racial justice, climate change? Does this suggest that leaders in ESG can build consensus from their full workplace constituencies and not just from one side of the aisle? Yeah, hi, Kevin, and hi, everyone. Pleasure to be with you all this bright and sunny morning for me here. Um, yes, you know, I think, first of all, what I found really compelling about this research um, is that, while it's, I think, very uh, pronounced in the US as a Democrat-Republican divide, these are global. And I, I think that was really also an important takeaway um, for a global company like VMware. And certainly we've seen that in, in our experience. And so my answer is, 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 a, is an emphatic yes, that companies that are leaders in ESG are able to navigate and depoliticize um, the workplace environment. And a lot of that has to do really with two things, with leadership and culture. Um, so, and I, and I think going back to the, the, the point about taking, you know, being active and um, taking a stand on social issues, I think it's been touched on well by Dan and Dylan, that, um, you know, it, it's, it's nuanced. It is nuanced. And, um, you know, in my view, I think the number one job for companies at this time is to discern the signal 
from the noise. And, um, and you know, we can certainly talk about how, how to do that, but I think that's, that's really critical to pay attention to, to that signal. And it is, I think it's, it's become clear that that is tied to your strategy. What is it that your purpose, what are you setting out to do in the world and your values? Um, and so in that is the signal around what you should pay attention to. Um, and I think at the end of the day, leaders in leading companies just can't be wallflowers, can't be wallflowers at this point in time. Um, and But I think the challenge, which I'd love to touch on some more is, is that, and the, the danger we're in today, I think is that there's not a lot of, um, experience uh, in how to deal with these volatile, sometimes uncertain, complex and ambiguous issues. Um, and I certainly can speak about what we do at VMware and, um, and I found works really well is that combination of deep listening from the top, but also I think as others have touched on, creating the structures and the environment within which you can have conversations, you can have dialogues that build a culture of trust and that's the foundation in my mind to civility one of the questions we've just gotten in from one of the attendees is whether these data support um greater activism by leaders of organizations on societal issues that means taking greater stands and nicola just to, to follow up on your last response do you you know is that would that be your read of of um of these results yeah, and I think, as I said, it's 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 certainly nuanced. Uh, I think the the question of what you take a stand on, what you take a stand on, and when, um, really is, as I, I said earlier, uh, a discernment um, uh, and a cl clarity in what matters to your business, what's material to your business, what's material to your stakeholders, um, and because you know. I think there are so many issues and challenges and like any business strategy, you can't, you can't do everything. So being really clear about what it is that is material to your business, that is where you lean in and that is where you take a stand in my, in my view. Great. Anu, I want to pull you in. And one of the interesting things that the research shows is that workers trust their coworkers and their managers more than they do the head of HR and their CEO. And the gap is particularly wide when it comes to telling the truth about their own organization with employee trust and the CEO and the HR head kind of low there. How do you interpret this and what does it mean for strategies for sharing information and building trust within a workplace? Uh, thanks, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here. And hello, everyone from Mumbai. Um, I think the themes uh, I would uh, call out are very similar to what uh, Dan, Dylan, and Nicola have already uh, referred to, but I think uh, uh, the reason we see this is really, um, and particularly speaking from an Asian perspective, is the power distance and the inherently hierarchical uh, structures in our society. Having said that, I really interpret this as in, in an organization as the presence or lack of psychological safety? How strong are your communication and listening posts? Is there a willingness to listen, learn, and act? And are these always on? Uh, and I think the CEO and the CHRO as uh, dispassionate and objective uh, people in the organization have the single largest role to play. It needs a deliberate effort uh, to make this a part of the DNA of the organization and must be something that the CEO and CHRO consciously uh, lead for and role model. How are we in the moments when bad news is given? I mean, if I take you to the world of consumer goods, um, I recall a time when uh, an eyeball competitor launched a product. We got news that they were going to launch a product uh, in a matter of days. And what did the teams do now? Worry about the loss of competitive, you know, the lack of competitive insight or competitive intelligence or muster up the courage to go to the leader and say, this is a situation on hand. And how the CEO reacted has a significant effect on the confidence of the people and what they will do in a similar situation. A culture is created when leaders uh, demonstrate uh, behavior or, the, or, you know, 
listening when it's the situation is the worst but you know culture is created by what we do in peace times uh, and we've got to sort of build that for when the situation when the time of reckoning comes uh, and just again to echo what has been said walk be accessible build engagement um, and also look at what you are incentivizing and rewarding because the wrong construct can lead to wrong behaviors Finally, I think that if leaders demonstrate vulnerability and the fact that they are not infallible, you encourage people to speak up. So I think these are some of the strategies that can work well. One of the I mean, one of the questions that we just got in is about the ex expectations and the role of the chief HR officer and the chief people officer specifically. You're you're the best person here to to answer this. I'm, I'm guessing. Um, in in a quick summary, how would you how would you answer that very specifically with regards to the chief people officer? Well, it's often said that you know the HR office, chief people officer, is the conscience keeper. You're the person uh, who has to really be uh, the most objective and non judge non judging listening post. Uh, and I think to be able to inspire that confidence where people come and talk to you, you have to be accessible, you have to be in touch with what's happening in the business and deeply connected at different levels in the organization. Uh, that's how um, a chief people officer can play a key role in sort of being a role model of some a leader who uh, shows openness to psych safety and trust. Great. Dane, I want to come back to you. There's a, um, there's been in the research, there's been a five point increase in job seekers looking for employers to take a stand on racial justice. And that's actually the largest increase in any of the societal issues the Trust Institute measures. Why do you think that is the issue that continues to have the largest employee focus? Well, I think I think part of I think there's a couple factors that really drive it. I think one, um, you have a whole bunch of macro trends coming in together. So one is just generally speaking, the greater diversification that you're finding in society, right? And so I've always had this view. This applies with the earlier question as well, that proximity brings breeds perspective. And so if you show up, and I used to make this argument, if you show up on campus and you're in this world of a diverse set of people in all shades and you hang out with a, a diverse group and then you go into your corporate lobby and you don't see it, that's shocking to you, right? That's not what your lived experience um, looks like. So I think part of it is just, you know, generational change and, um, and people growing up in a more diverse, more connected environment, both culturally and via technology right? This meeting of us would probably not necessarily as easily happen, right? But we're able to do it because, because we can do it in Zoom. So I think that's one. I think the, the second um, uh, piece of it that is, is really driving it is the awareness around the subject. Um, and so um, there, like anything, you know, George Floyd, we could debate for a long time, was a uh, wide, was a galvanizing event. Um, and like any galvanizing event, it created organizations, it created networks around that event who have a agenda to advance it. And those uh, that agenda is well funded now as a result of what's going on. There's people committed to it. So frankly, it's just the resource allocation to the issue is the highest it's, it's ever been. And so, um, you know, I would expect it uh, uh, to continue. Then the last thing I would say about it is, you know, it's been, uh, this is now a personal opinion. It's, you know, some people call it America's original sin. It's been around for a long, long time. So the reason I say that that's so important is because the unlayering of that onion is not one level. Right. And so it's gonna, it's one of those things that as you dig into and dig into, you're gonna find more and more because of the multi hundred years of this issue. And so that's also a reason that it's gonna to continue to grow because this isn't an event that you can just wave a wand at and make disappear. This is could deeply embedded in our history and our past. Yeah. Could you just quick quickly tell us some of the ways that you're seeing companies doing a good job of getting their own house in order internally around these questions of racial justice? Yeah, I, I can tell. I will tell you both how they're doing well and what not to do. Um, so one of the things that is the biggest one that has been expressed here is a lot of people aren't experts in this issue who lead companies, and they should acknowledge it right from the front. This is a case where sometimes the best leadership is raising other people up 
who are are closer to it and you being it the ultimate active listener role is listening to a bunch of other people and saying nothing and so I, I think that, you know, things that people are, are doing, you have to figure out where your organization is in this. This is a space where the organizations, there's wide variance um, um, in where people are. And, and the best thing that I can say that I would push everybody to do is to have a multi-year plan. The biggest challenge, I think, in jumping into race is that if you don't even have the basic um, skills and culture around having um, contentious conversations, jumping into one of the more contentious conversations right out of the out of the gate could be a recipe for failure. So I think it's okay. I, you know, I've said this to many clients, A, you're, you are where you are, you're a baby in this process. Like, just take the first step. Year one, don't go gangbusters and do a whole bunch of things that you don't understand what the implications are. Set out a multi-year intentional plan, but really look at it as a long-term plan. The biggest you know, check that I would have for a company is, are they trying to adjust racial justice in a multi-year plan? That would be my okay, biggest test. Point. Great. And this is a, the, and think about the first step. Dylan, I want to, one of the findings of the survey data are that uh, trust is a two-way compact between employer and employee. And specifically those who feel trusted by their CEO manager are more likely to grant that leader their trust in return. Thinking about next-gen uh, workers, leaders, Gen Z, what are the specific ways that they want to see that trust demonstrated in them in the workplace? I believe Richard shared this quote from the report in his overview, to earn their trust, give them yours. And I think that really hits the nail on the head, Kevin. Uh, to earn their trust, give them yours. What does that look like? Well, for Gen Z, for this next generation, we have a really high sense of fairness and equity. Also, a, a manifest and a desire to feel empowered and empowerment broadly. Uh, that looks a lot more than, okay, you get to work from home remotely on Friday. You get you know, the, the office break and you could pick your, your vacation days. That looks like, do we have say in issues like this? Right? I love how Dane put it. Young workers are not looking for their bosses to have every answer. Of course, you have to have some. You have to at least have the plan to go about finding those answers. And this is not an excuse to, to never have a response, but be transparent, be authentic. Who is involved in creating your multi-year plan? Are you bringing these folks in? If inevitably you're going to look to them to follow suit, to get in line behind this plan, well, they should probably have a say. They should probably feel ownership, a culture of ownership where we can actually feel like we are making a difference as young people, even if that is in a smaller area within a larger organization. Right? I'm sure whether it's at Unilever or Next Gen HQ, there are orders of magnitude, different levels of employees here. And, and that has the structure associated with it, the different management levels. Uh, but giving folks opportunities to feel heard and then to let the organization know when they have a desire to be, uh, let's say, involved and to be impacted. I think that's the that's the game. Uh, really identifying your issues, finding that strategy, as we all talked about in different ways and, and shapes and forms here, and then making sure the right stakeholder, your future leaders, your future managers are involved from the ground floor. If you feel invested in as a young person, you're going to give that back to your company. If you feel heard, you're going to be more willing to share your ideas. And if you're listening to this and, and you are an employer who prides themselves on being diverse, well, you hired a diverse workforce for a reason. Leverage that, right? Don't hide behind it as a checkbox. Use it to your advantage to drive your organization forward. So a lot of it is about feeling heard on issues like return to workplace that, that we're, rather than coming back with, um, with answers. Nicola, I want to come to you and, and focus on something that Richard uh, spoke about, which is the fact that there's an opportunity for businesses to help bolster trust in other institutions where trust is actually lower, such as NGOs, government, and media. Do you see specific ways that businesses can do that? Yeah, Kevin, I thought that was a fascinating finding from, from this research. And, uh, you know, I, I think the, the reality is that business doesn't operate as an island. Right, we're 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 embedded in communities, and um, and I, and it kind of goes back to I think what I was saying earlier is really understanding that interdependence that companies have on the social structures, and I would even extend that, given what I do, to the you know ecological and broad economic structures around us, and um, and so I, I think it. 
I, I think the message from this work, and it certainly resonates with what we try to do at VMware, is to start at home, right? To build that that those cultures uh, and those structures internally to create that civility. I think um, at the end of the day, it's in everyone's interest. It's in our interest from a, a, a business and a commercial perspective to have healthy and stable institutions. So um, yes, and I think there are there are pragmatic things that we can do. I do think that it is complex, right? There's no silver bullet here, uh, but I, I think that companies now have almost more of a responsibility to try to extend that, um, you know, those practices and uh, um, uh, approaches to their relationships with their stakeholders. So, you know, I think about the company's value chain and starting with that, um, you know, that that domain and embodying those principles in all of your engagements with your stakeholders. Um, so I, I, I would love to see where this goes next year, and I'll certainly be looking to, to next year's report to, to see uh, more clarity from, from other organizations and ways that they can do this. But uh, I do think it's a challenge. It's a clarion call, as, as uh, Richard said at the, at, at the uh, start of his remarks. This is a new, we find ourselves in a new, in a new reality. Um, and I think leading companies are all hands on deck to figure out how to do this because it's in all of our uh, enlightened self-interest yeah. to create more stability. Well, and it seems like there are two ways that they can, that leaders and businesses can do this. One is by having fair dynamic workplaces who's, who, that positively spill over into how people show up in society more broadly. And secondly, maybe something that organizations, a lot of them have been probably slow to do is to very explicitly state the, uh, the importance of these other institutions like government and NGOs and and media in in and re reiterate that in in their interactions with their workforce. We just have a few uh, quick minutes left. Anu, I want to come back to you. You were talking about, and we have a question from one of the attendees. Um, you were talking about the foundational work around trust in peacetime before, and the question is, what are the most effective channels for two way CEO staff leadership employee communication so that staff feel heard? In your experience, are there any particular ways of approaching this that are, you know, that that get at what we've been talking about here, where people feel heard, where they feel like they have a stake in the decision making, where they feel trust? What what would you recommend? Uh, so I think the one thing that uh, we really learned during the last two years of the pandemic was that uh, you really have to. Um, notch up and build up the number of listening posts in the organization for communication to happen. Often the mistake we make as leaders and organizations is in believing that a message once given through a town hall or a, a piece of communication is uh, landed. And it's, I mean, we've all heard it being said that a message needs to be repeated eight or nine times before it lands. And it couldn't be more true uh, than something that's to do with a significant cultural change or uh, something that we really want to see standing, long standing in the organization. And therefore, I think it's important to have different channels of communication, formal, informal, written, town halls, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, and each of them serve a different purpose. For example, during the uh, during the pandemic, the our CEO would just get groups of people together virtually, where the purpose of the conversation was just to say, "How are you?" and "How are you getting along?" and different channels of communication together. Uh, that might seemingly serve different purposes, I think come together to create that openness. And um, it's not easy to get feedback or bad news. And I think leaders really have to extend themselves uh, and go the extra mile to ask and to ferret it out. Therefore, a multiplicity of communication forums and channels is what I would say. Yeah, so they, they need to be open, and this goes back to what Dylan was talking about, to getting this feedback, not having the answers, feeling comfortable, and actually just being uh, just being available. 
Um, so we're actually just about out of time. I'm going to, I think Richard is going to come back in a second. I mean, there's some clear takeaways here in addition to what Richard was talking about, um, about the opportunity that, you know, that's been highlighted for, from your comments, how to, how for leaders to think about how specifically to nurture and train their staff in civil discourse. Uh, so that is possible in the workplace, but also spills over into society. Um, more, more broadly, there's definitely a demand on both sides of the political aisle or all sides of the political sphere uh, for, for business engagement in these um, societal issues. Um, and there's an opportunity, as Richard said, for leaders to bolster other institutions such as media, NGOs, uh, government. And then uh, finally, um, this, this sort of leadership posture of listening and engagement, um, and maybe as Dane suggested also, acknowledging that uh, sometimes decisions are the choices between uh, what's worse and what's terrible and having to, uh, to find the right path there. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, Dane, Dylan, Nicola, and Anu for uh, this discussion. And Richard, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, again, thanks to the panel. Two or three remarks. One, I've talked to a bunch of CEOs who think that an impending recession will um, somehow change um, the workplace back to what it was. That's not happening. We've seen a fundamental change in the contract between employer and, and employee. And so whether it's hybrid workplace, whether it's the ability for employees to feed into company strategy um, or the ability to speak up on issues, um, the employee now recognizes um, his or her new deal, and they want that. And we in business should be smart enough to empower them, to inform them, and to enable them. The second point I would make to you, um, there is going to be um, a lot of pressure on companies in the coming months related to inflation, um, the disparity between what they can afford to pay in terms of raises, the, the inflation numbers. Um, and we have to be sensitive to this and, and be conscious, particularly at the lower end of the uh, scale. Um, I think you noted in the research that, um, frankly, the person on the, on the line, um, the blue collar worker doesn't trust management. They trust their coworkers. We've got to give enough information to um, managers down the line and also to workers themselves so that they feel as if they are in the know um, and have them be um, still bought into the, to the, to the game. Um, the last thing I would just say is um, this finding about my employer being the most trusted institution is not um, a permanent one. It's not a uh, thing that you should take for granted in any way. Um, we earn that every day and every CEO um, and, and, and CCO should take very seriously the privilege of my employer trust and make sure that all of us act, one, in the interests of our people and two, in the interests of society. So with that, with apologies for the uh, hiccup on the technology uh, and that we'll send all of you the entire deck and an entire uh, transcript of remarks. Thank you all again for joining us.